the Ebionites were later branded as heretics by the Proto-Orthodox. That's a shorthand way of uh, unpacking what I've just been trying to explain. Ebionites were later branded as heretics by the Proto-Orthodox. As it turns out, from a historical perspective, this condemnation of the Ebionites is somewhat ironic because the perspectives that they held appear historically to have been closer to the views of Jesus' own apostles than those that ended up becoming embedded in the Nicene Creed that came out of the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 and other forms of orthodoxy. We will be dealing with an irony in this particular lecture that the Ebionites are condemned as heretics even though their point of view does historically appear to be closer to the original view of Jesus and his apostles. That's the, uh, one of the issues we'll be dealing with in this lecture about how that came about. Our sources of information about the Ebionites are regrettably limited. We don't have any writings by any Ebionite author. We have to rely on the words of their opponents in order to know what the Ebionites believed and stood for. And uh, obviously it's a difficult situation when you have to rely on what an opponent says in order to understand the beliefs and practices of a group because an opponent is attacking these beliefs and practices, may be given to caricature these beliefs and practices, and possibly doesn't even understand the beliefs and practices. But in this particular case, that's all we have. We have the writings of the Ebionites' opponents. In particular, we have two authors, uh, one of whom is proto-Orthodox and the other is Orthodox. Irenaeus is an important author whom we will encounter several times throughout this course of lectures. Irenaeus was a bishop of uh, the land of Gaul, modern-day France, who wrote a very important book around the year 180 of the Common Era, 180 AD. He wrote a five-volume book against the heresies in which he deals with the Ebionites. Some 160 years later, there is a second author who deals with the Ebionites, an author who's named uh, Epiphanius. Epiphanius was a, uh, also a bishop who uh, was uh, located at Salamis. He was writing a book against heresies around the year 340 A.D. These are two of our major sources for understanding the Ebionites, these Jewish Christian uh, adoptionists. On occasion, the Ebionites' own writings will be quoted by these authors, and so that's quite useful when you have their own works quoted, but unfortunately none of their writings actually survive. The Ebionites were a group of Jewish Christians who either were born Jewish or were converted to Judaism, who kept Jewish customs and strictly followed Jewish laws, including the laws of circumcision, Sabbath observance, and kosher food. Yet, even though they were born or converted to Judaism, raised Jewish, maintained Jewish customs and cultures, they nonetheless believed that Jesus was the Messiah of God. This is the distinctive feature of this particular group. They continue to be Jewish, and yet they believe in Jesus as the Messiah. It'll be helpful for un unpacking what I want to say about the Ebionites to understand something about what it meant to be Jewish in the ancient world. In the ancient world, the ancient Roman world of 2,000 years ago, virtually everybody was a pagan. The term pagan used by historians doesn't have the negative connotations that we today might use uh, when we use the term pagan, I might refer to my next door neighbor as a pagan because he throws his beer cans out into the yard and generally is unkempt and uh, a bit wild. But that isn't what a historian means when a historian refers to the term pagan. Pagan for uh, ancient historians simply refers to anybody in the ancient world who was a polytheist, someone who worshipped the many gods. Pagans are uh, anybody in the ancient world who is neither Jewish nor Christian. We'll deal more with what paganism was later on in this course of lectures. Jews stood out from the world of paganism precisely because they did not worship many gods. They were not polytheists. Jews in the ancient Roman Empire, as Jews today, were monotheists. They believed there was only one god. Moreover, he was their god. Jews maintained that they worshiped the one god who had created this world and who had chosen them to be his people. As recorded in their sacred scriptures, the Hebrew Bible that Christians call the Old Testament. God created the world, chose Israel to be his people, and then gave them his law so that they could live in ways that were appropriate to the worship of God and to the love of their neighbor. The Jewish law was given to the Jews by God through Moses, they believed, in order to maintain their relationship with God, a relationship that was understood to be a covenantal relationship. God had made a covenant, an agreement 
with the Jews to be their God so long as they would be his people. They maintained their relationship with God by being his people, by, by obeying his law. This set Jews apart from everybody else in the ancient world. Their belief in the one God who had called them to be his people and they kept his law, the law of Moses in the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Old Testament. Ebionites were and considered themselves to be Jews who were different from other Jews because these Jews believed that Jesus was the Messiah. More specifically, the Ebionites maintained that Jesus had been the most righteous man on earth. Jesus was Jewish, who kept the law better than anybody else, and as a reward for his righteousness, God had adopted Jesus to be his son. Most Ebionites appear to have believed that God adopted Jesus at his baptism. Jesus went to be baptized by John the Baptist, and according to some of our earliest accounts, Jesus is uh, put under the water by John, and then when he emerges from the water, he looks and he sees the heavens split open, the Spirit of God descending as a dove upon him, and then he hears a voice from heaven. In some of our earliest traditions, the voice says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. A quotation of the scriptures, Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. Jesus was begotten by God at his baptism. These Ebionites believed this is something that had actually happened, that Jesus was the man chosen by God. But chosen for what? He was chosen to fulfill a specific task. He was to fulfill the Jewish expectations of the Messiah by dying for the sins of the world. These Ebionites maintained then that Jesus fulfilled his mission by going to the cross as God asked of him. And as a reward, God then raised him from the dead. So that Jesus was a sacrifice for the sins of the world. He was a human chosen by God to die. He died to fulfill his mission. And then God raised him from the dead. The Ebionites then believed that since Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, who had been appointed by the Jewish God as the savior of the Jewish people in fulfillment of the Jewish law, that of course anyone who wanted to follow Jesus and anyone who wanted to be right with the God of Jesus obviously had to be Jewish. What about people who weren't Jewish? They had to become Jewish by converting to Judaism. For the Ebionites, Christianity is a Jewish religion, not a pagan religion, not a Gentile religion, not a religion of the non-Jews, the Gentiles. It's a religion of the Jews. As a consequence, Ebionites tried to convert other Jews to their faith in Jesus, and if they converted any Gentiles to faith in Jesus, Gentiles meaning non-Jews, they insisted that the Gentiles first convert to Judaism. Ebionites differed from other Jews in the ancient world in several ways. First of all, of course, they differed in saying that Jesus was the Messiah. Most Jews did not accept the idea that Jesus was the Messiah. Most Jews found this claim that Jesus was the Messiah to be completely ridiculous. This was true from the very beginnings of Christianity right after the death of Jesus and continued to be true through our period through the second and third centuries. Jews had an idea of what the Messiah was going to be. The Messiah was to be a Jewish savior. The Messiah is referred to in the Hebrew scriptures and in other Jewish writings from the first, second centuries. There are different conceptions of what the Messiah would be like for Jews in antiquity, even though these different conceptions had some basic things in common. Some Jews, though, expected a Messiah who would be a political figure, somebody like King David of old who would lead the Jewish armies against their oppressors and drive their oppressors out from the land and set up Israel as a sovereign state in the land that God had given them. He'd be a powerful ruler, a military leader, a general of the Jewish armies. Other Jews thought that God would send a Messiah not as a human figure, but as a kind of a divine figure, a great powerful cosmic savior from heaven who would overthrow the powers of evil to bring in God's good kingdom. And other Jews had other expectations of what the Messiah would be like, the one thing all the Jews had in common in expecting the Messiah, though, was the Messiah would be somebody who was great and powerful, who could overthrow God's enemies. For anybody to say that Jesus was the Messiah struck most Jews as completely absurd. Jesus didn't head the Jewish armies. Jesus didn't overthrow the Romans. Jesus didn't set up a kingdom in Jerusalem. Jesus didn't come on the clouds of heaven to destroy the forces of evil. Jesus was an itinerant teacher from Galilee, who was handed over to the Roman authorities, who crucified him. This crucified man is the Messiah? Most Jews found the claim to be absurd. Ebionites, though, maintained that, yes, Jesus was the Messiah, who was to save the people not by leading them to some kind of political victory or not by overcoming the forces of evil by coming from heaven. He overcame the power of sin by dying on the cross, as God had commanded him. 
for these Ebionites that Jesus was the Messiah, that made them quite different from other Jews in antiquity. They were different from Jews in a couple of other ways as well. For one thing, these Ebionites maintained that since Jesus had died for sins, he was the perfect sacrifice for sins. So, Jews who were Ebionites no longer believed in performing sacrifices. Uh, as you probably know in the Hebrew Scriptures, Jews are commanded to perform sacrifices to God in the temple in Jerusalem. These Ebionites maintained that since Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, there's no need for any further sacrifice. And so uh, they didn't hold to the idea of Jewish sacrifice being in force any longer. Moreover, since it uh, was the case that most people in the ancient world ate meat only when it had been sacrificed in a religious ceremony, and since these Jews don't believe in sacrifice, Jewish Ebionites were necessarily vegetarian. And so they kept a vegetarian diet. This, this separated these Ebionites from other Jews. Of greater significance to our course is that these Ebionites also differed from other Christians in that they insisted on remaining Jewish. They insisted on remaining Jewish, which made them, of course, different from other Christians because, as we'll see, most Christians, of course, had abandoned Judaism or, in fact, had never been Jews and had no plans of becoming Jews. They differ from other Christians in a number of other ways, too, uh, the most striking of which is that they denied that Jesus was himself divine in any way. These Ebionites maintained that Jesus was a Jewish man. He was completely man. He, he was fully human. He was born of the sexual union of Joseph and Mary, two Jews, born as everyone else is born, and only adopted to be God, God's son, only adopted to be God's son at the baptism. The Ebionites, therefore, did not hold to the doctrine of the virgin birth, or to Jesus' pre-existence, or to his divinity. But how could they deny the divinity? Or how could they deny his pre-existence? Or how could they deny his virgin birth? Hadn't they read what's said in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, that Jesus was born to a virgin? Hadn't they read the Gospel of John, that Jesus pre-existed and was a divine being? Well, in fact, as we'll see, the Ebionites did not have these Gospels in their canon of Scripture. They had other books that supported their points of view. The proto-Orthodox Christians condemned Ebionites as heretics. To understand this condemnation, we need to have a little bit more historical background. And so the historical background about the Ebionites and where they came from. Historically speaking, Jesus himself was Jewish in every way. He was raised in a Jewish family. He adopted Jewish culture. He kept the Jewish law. He was recognized as a Jewish rabbi who, who interpreted the Jewish law. Historically speaking, Jesus was Jewish. From a historical point of view, the Ebionite understanding of Jesus is therefore probably right, that he, was, that he was a Jew. But by the second century, most Christian converts were former pagans who had converted to believe in one God after they had been worshiping many gods. These former pagans who came to believe in Jesus and in the one God were not interested in becoming Jewish. To become Jewish, they would have to keep the Sabbath requirements. They'd have to keep the kosher food laws, which means not eating pork, not eating shellfish. And if they were men, it would mean getting circumcised. And it's quite understandable that most pagans, especially pagan men, were not interested in becoming Jewish. Starting as early as the Apostle Paul, back in uh, the middle of the first century, Christianity started appealing to Gentiles by urging that they did not have to become Jews in order to accept the salvation brought by the Jewish God. Paul himself insisted in some of his writings in the New Testament that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus and not by keeping the Jewish law. Paul insisted that, in fact, if a Gentile tried to keep the Jewish law to be right with God, that Gentile was in danger of falling from grace. As you might imagine, the Ebionites did not think highly of Paul. They claimed to follow the teachings of James. James, Jesus' own earthly brother, who had become the head of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus' death. What writings then did the Ebionites have to support their points of view? Well, we know that they had a couple of different Gospels. One of the Gospels they had was very much like our Gospel of Matthew, which, as you may know, is the most Jewish of the four Gospels in the New Testament. The Ebionites had a form of the Gospel of Matthew that they called something else. They called it the Gospel of the Nazarenes. They called it the Gospel of the Nazarenes. It may have been an Aramaic translation of Matthew. Aramaic is a Semitic language, much like, the, um, much like Hebrew. Apparently, this Gospel of the Nazarenes, written in Aramaic, did not have chapters 1 and 2 of Matthew's Gospel. 
Why did not why did it not have Matthew chapters 1 and 2? Because those are the chapters that describe Jesus being born of a virgin. So, one of the books they had was the Gospel of the Nazarenes, an Aramaic translation of something like our Matthew. A second Gospel that they had is a Gospel that's called simply the Gospel of the Ebionites. The Gospel of the Ebionites is a very interesting Gospel because it appears to have... Uh, originated by taking Matthew, Mark, and Luke and splicing them together in places, leaving out portions that were not amenable to the Ebionite understanding of Jesus. And so it was kind of like a gospel harmony in which they would take the different stories of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and put them together into one story that was suitable for their own beliefs. This gospel of the Ebionites had some very interesting modifications, judging from the way it's quoted by our church fathers, Irenaeus and Epiphanius. One of the most interesting uh, emphases in this gospel has to do with the vegetarian diet of the Ebionites. As you recall, in the gospel stories, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, is said to have had a, a diet in the wilderness of locusts and wild honey, which has not uh, attracted too many people to become followers of John the Baptist in the modern period, since eating locusts and wild honey doesn't sound all that appetizing. But as it turns out, in the gospel of the Ebionites, there is a slight, slight change. If you take the word locusts, in Greek, and you change one letter, you change it to the word pancake. In the e Gospel of the Ebionites, John the Baptist is said to have eaten pancakes and wild honey, which is both more appealing and vegetarian. In conclusion, the Ebionites, who had these two books, the Gospel of the Nazarenes, the Gospel of the Ebionites, may well have represented one of the earliest forms of Christianity, because it was a Jewish form of Christianity, very much like the belief of Jesus' earliest followers, probably. How ironic, then, that this form of Christianity, originally associated with Jesus' sibling, James, should fall out of disfavor and be declared a, a heresy. But Christian belief has never been stagnant. It moves on, and it changes. And anyone who maintains the older view as a result is left behind, or, in the case of the Ebionites, becomes declared a heretic. says arguments from history against the divinity and pre-existence of Christ. In other words, he's looked at the Bible and now he's looking at the history of the church that follows. The great objection that Jews have always made to Christianity in its present state is that it enjoins the worship of, one, of more gods than one. Now that's true, by the way. If you've ever gotten into a conversation with a, a Jewish person and tried to share your faith with them, one of their objections always will be, well, wait a minute, we were taught, and the Bible teaches, the book of Deuteronomy teaches that there's only one God, and you Christians believe that there are three gods. So that's never going to fly. And he doesn't mention it here, but it's of practical consideration that the Muslims also, that is their primary objection to Christianity because they were taught that there is only one God. They call him Allah, but there's only one God. Whereas they say, you Christians believe that there are three gods. That's their understanding. Their explanation of the Trinity is that there are three gods. So he's talking about what the Jews' objection to Christianity has always been that, that they believe in more gods than one. All the Jewish Christians, after the destruction of Jerusalem, that was about 70 A.D., all of the... Jewish Christians, after the destruction of Jerusalem, immediately after the age of the apostles, are said to have been Ebionites. And I did look up that word. Ebionites was a form, was a branch of Christianity that was predominant amongst the early Jews, which tried to hold to the teachings of Jesus and keeping the law of the Old Testament. In other words, they were, they were Jews who believed in Jesus as the Messiah, but they still kept all of the Old Testament dietary laws. You can't eat pork. You can't eat unclean foods. Uh, observing the Sabbath rituals, uh, bringing their sacrifices uh, to the temple. Well, until the temple was destroyed, that is. The Ebionites. These were the only two of sorts, some of them holding the miraculous conception of our Savior and others believing that he was the son of Joseph as well as Mary. In other words, among some of the Ebionites, this particular sect of Judaism, there was a dispute about the, the, the virgin birth, whether that happened or not. None of them are said to have believed either that Jesus was God or the maker of the world under God. And it is at all, and is it at all credible that the body of the Jewish Christians, if they had ever instructed by the apostles in the doctrine of the divinity or preexistence of Christ, would soon and so generally, if not universally, have abandoned that faith? 
Had Christ been considered as God or the maker of the world under God in the early ages of the church, he would naturally have been the proper object of prayer to Christians. In other words, they would have prayed to him. Nay, more so than God the Father with whom, on the scheme of the doctrine of the Trinity, they must have known that they had less immediate intercourse. But prayers to Jesus Christ were not used in early times, but gained ground gradually with the opinion of Christ being God and the object of worship. In other words, first Christians didn't pray to Jesus. They prayed to God through Jesus, but they didn't pray to Jesus. Hegesippus, the first Christian historian, in other words, the first Christian who wrote about the history, himself a Jew and therefore probably an Ebionite, Enumerating the heresies of his time, mentioned several of the Gnostic kind. Remember, the Gnostics believed that Jesus wasn't really human, that he only appeared as a human being. He moreover says that in traveling to Rome, where he arrived at that time, he found that all the churches he visited held the faith which had been taught by Christ and the apostles, which, in his opinion, was probably that of Christ being not God. In other words, the early church taught that Jesus was not God, but that he was a human being, the Son of God. Justin Martyr also and Clemens Alexandrius, who wrote after him, treat largely of heresies in general without mentioning or alluding to the Unitarian. In other words, if if Unitarians, to believe in only one God and that Jesus is the Son of God, if that had been a heresy, then they would have written about it and they would have condemned it, but they don't. In fact, everyone there seemed to believe the same thing. All those who were deemed heretics in early times were cut off from the communion of those who called themselves the Orthodox Christian. In other words, they couldn't worship, they couldn't take communion. And they went by some particular name, generally that of their leader. But the Unitarians among the Gentiles were not expelled from the assemblies of Christians, but worshipped along with those who were called Orthodox and had no particular name till the time of Victor who excommunicated Theodotus. And for a long time after that, Epiphanius endeavored to give them the name Algoi. And although the Ebionites probably about or before that time had been excommunicated by the Gentile Christians, it was, as Jerome says, only on account of their rigid adherence to the law of Moses. In other words, they didn't want to associate with them because they said you had to keep the law of Moses. It had nothing to do with their understanding that Jesus was not part of the Trinity. exception. The Ebionites were Jewish Christians who understood themselves to be the true followers of Jesus who had a who had a Jewish understanding of the faith and they claimed that their beliefs were supported principally by James the brother of Jesus and by his closest disciple Peter the uh, the leaders of the Jerusalem church and uh, there are lots of historians who think that in fact this claim is completely valid mm. uh, that in fact uh, the Jewish Christianity represented by the later Ebionites in fact is the earliest form of Christianity that, that we can attest. And so I, uh, I, I don't think that it's quite accurate to say that everybody thought that Jesus was divine in the early church, just the opposite.